All right, so far we have covered a lot of information and aspects of pulmonary artery catheters. For this final lesson in this series, I'm gonna be quickly reviewing over some of the common troubleshooting scenarios that we come across. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right in. And the first troubleshooting thing that I'm going to talk about is if we are overwedged. So I did discuss this in the lesson when I talked about abnormal waveforms, um, but I did want to quickly go over this again here so it's all consolidated in one lesson. So the first thing we need to do is to remove air by detaching the syringe and then seeing the overwedge waveform go back to a normal pulmonary artery waveform. Next, we're going to want to slowly inflate with air until we get a proper wedge, and we want to record the amount of air that it took to get to that point because we then want to stop putting in air once we see that proper wedge waveform. So this is really important to prevent the overinflation of the balloon in the pulmonary artery, especially in the future as other people are doing it, because doing so that this could actually lead to pulmonary artery rupture, which is a life-threatening emergency. Now from there, once we have that wedge and we've recorded the amount of air, then we want to let the air out, again ensuring that we have a return to our normal PA waveform. And then finally, we also want to make note of the centimeter length marking on the PA catheter, really to ensure that we have not advanced further and whether it may need repositioning. All right, so the next bit of troubleshooting is gonna be if we have a catheter in the right ventricle. So I also talked about this lesson in that lesson on abnormal waveforms. Um, but after you note that there is an RV waveform instead of a PA, the first thing that we want to try to do is to inflate the balloon and see if it just naturally floats back into the pulmonary artery. In doing so, we'd want to observe the RV waveform transition with the classic step up into our PA waveform, and then shortly after that, we should see a wedge waveform appear. Now, once that wedge is observed, we want to detach the syringe to remove the air. We should see a return of the normal PA waveform. Now, if it returns to RV, or we never actually left the RV, then we want to ensure that the balloon is inflated, and this is to minimize any irritation in the right ventricle. Basically, this pads the tip of the catheter and can help prevent some of that ectopy that can happen. From here, try repositioning the patient. Typically, having them lie on their left side is going to be the best position to assist with this natural floating. Again, in doing so, we want to be looking for that RV waveform, changing to a PA waveform, and then changing to a wedge, because at that point, again, we need to remove the air from the balloon. If we're still unsuccessful, then you do want to contact the provider right away in order for them to reposition. If you are having lots of ectopy, ensure that the air is out of the balloon, and then pull back the pulmonary artery catheter until we have that right atrial pressure or CVP waveform, and then await for the provider to potentially come and refloat it. All right, next is going to be if we have a spontaneously wedged waveform. And then lastly, for those that I've already kind of hit on during that abnormal waveforms lesson, if you do notice suddenly a wedge waveform and you're not actively inflating the balloon and, and trying to get a wedge, then first you want to ensure that air is removed from the balloon. So again, detach the syringe, make sure that that gate is open. And then quickly you want to assess for any causes of a dampened waveform, um, which I'm going to cover in just a minute here. You can also try having the patient adjust their position. So try them on their left, try them on their right sitting up, lying down. Also, if they're able to, ask them to cough, or if they're on the vent, we can stimulate that cough via the endotracheal tube suctioning. Basically, we probably have a catheter that's just gone too far in or ended up migrating into a, a different vessel that's now smaller and has ended up in a wedged waveform, and therefore doing some of these repositioning and coughing can help to adjust the position of that catheter so that we come out of that wedge. Now that said, if you still don't see a transition from the wedge to the pulmonary artery, then you need to contact the provider immediately. The patient is at risk for lung infarction, as well as damage to the pulmonary artery, which could lead to rupture, again, a life-threatening situation. Now either you, if the hospital allows, or the provider may need to pull the catheter back a little bit until the wedge waveform goes away, 
and the pulmonary artery waveform returns. And really important, remember to never flush a PA catheter when it's wedged. This is another situation that could lead to rupture of the pulmonary artery. All right, next troubleshooting is if we have an absent waveform. So if you're not getting a waveform, then there's a couple things that you're gonna to wanna to check real quick. So if you have values for your PA pressure, um, then you might need to just try adjusting the scale that's on your monitor. Sometime if the pressure goes too high or too low, um, they can drop out of the scale that they're currently set to view. Ideally, we want our PA catheter to be at the 40 millimeters of mercury scale, but again, things sometimes can end up out of this scale. Now from there, we wanna check and make sure that all the cables, so this is both the monitor end and the PA catheter patient end, we wanna make sure that these are securely attached. So next, you're gonna to wanna to check all your stopcocks to ensure that you have an open path from the patient to the transducer. You wanna make sure that all the pressure tubing connections are tight and that they are actually connected to the PA catheter. Make sure that there's no kink in the system. Ensure that the monitor actually has the PA catheter parameter turned on. From there, you also want to make sure that you have enough fluid in your pressure bag and that it is appropriately inflated, then re-level and zero. You can also try aspirating blood from the affected port, and really you want to ensure that you have good blood return and then a good ability to flush afterwards. If you still have no waveform but everything else checks out, then first try replacing the cables that you're using, then if that doesn't fix it, then try replacing that transducer, and then finally, if all still fails, or you're unable to aspirate blood, then you want to contact the provider as it may be an issue with the catheter, and that catheter may need to be replaced. That said, it is possible that the port that's being transduced is just completely occluded, which is something that might be able to be fixed with some repositioning. All right, next let's talk about an overdamped waveform. So when the waveform is appearing too damped, aka overdamped, then there's a few things that we want to check. So first off, perform a square wave test, a fast flush test, and ensure that you are getting a damped response. I'm not gonna go over this here, um, but I will refer you to a lesson that I previously did on arterial lines where I went over this in more detail, so make sure and watch that if you need to. But from there, if you do confirm that you are over damped, then make sure that all connections are tight and that there is enough fluid in the pressure bag and again, that it's appropriately inflated. So you wanna check for any error in the transducer or the pressure tubing. If it is present, then you're gonna to need to remove it and then ensure that you have a continuous flow of fluid. If air is present anywhere before the final stopcock, then simply turn the stopcock off to the patient and then fast flush the air out the stopcock. Now, if air is present after the last stopcock, then basically you're gonna to need to aspirate blood back, so this is gonna bring the air with it, before we then fast flush the blood back in and clear the line. Now from here, we do also wanna try aspirating blood from the line. Um, it is something that should pretty easily aspirate. If it's extra sluggish, then this can lead to a damped waveform. So we do wanna to attempt to do a fast flush with the pressure tubing, that said, a more forceful pulsating flush may be needed with a 10 ml syringe in order to clear up whatever it was that was causing that damping. And then finally, we wanna check the transducer and just make sure that there's no blood in there. Um, if there is blood and it is present in there, try fast flushing that blood out. If it's still damped after that, you can also try replacing that transducer. From there, if we still have no resolution, let the provider know as again, the catheter may need to be replaced. All right, next is gonna be our underdamped waveform. So the opposite of our overdamped. So you may also notice that your patient has the underdamped or whipped as we used to call it waveform. And remember that this is where the highs are too high and the lows are too low. So if this is something that's suspected, again, perform that square wave fast flush test and ensure underdamping. So again, you're gonna have those excessive oscillations returning to baseline. And typically this is something that's caused by too much tubing, or too many stopcocks. So you wanna ensure that you don't have any unnecessary extensions or stopcocks in place. If so, go ahead and remove those. Um, also check for air bubbles as small air bubbles may also cause this. Uh, a faulty transducer can also be the culprit, so try changing that out as well. Um, if you still have no improvement, then again, contact the provider and collaborate with them on possible solutions and how they wanna handle that. All right, the next troubleshooting step is gonna be when we are actually unable to get a wedge. Again, this is only gonna apply if you're actually doing wedges, but sometimes when we inflate the balloon, we don't get a wedge waveform, and thus you're gonna to wanna to check the centimeter marking and ensure that there's been no change there. So to start, we wanna ensure that the full 1.5 mLs of air was actually used. Then we wanna allow the air to passively return from the balloon to the syringe. 
Typically, we disconnect the syringe to allow the air out, but we want the, the air to come back into the syringe so that we can check it. Now, if it doesn't come back, or if you note blood coming back in the line, then the balloon is probably ruptured. From this point forward, you want to make sure that you don't inject any more air, and then you want to close off that gate and disconnect the syringe. And then you want to place tape over the balloon port and identify it as being ruptured. Now, if it is ruptured, or you're unable to get a wedge uh, after doing this troubleshooting, even if you do get the air back, then you want to contact the provider. If you're just unable to wedge, then the catheter may need to be advanced a little bit further. If it's ruptured, then either the balloon can no longer be used to get a wedge, or the catheter may actually need to be replaced if they do want to continue getting those wedge pressures. All right, so the next troubleshooting is going to be in general if we have any unexpected changes in any of the pressures, so right atrial pressure, pulmonary artery pressure, wedge pressure, any unexpected changes that come about. So if you notice any change in either of those waveforms or values that really aren't explained by anything that's happening, you're going to want to troubleshoot a couple things. So first, make sure that the patient's head of bed is anywhere from flat supine to 45 degrees and that we do have the transducer leveled at flebostatic axis. Go ahead and re-zero the transducer. Check for any bubbles and remove those if they're present. Obviously assess your patient and really compare that to what our hemodynamic parameters that we're seeing. And this includes getting your calculations, cardiac output if you need to shoot a bolus for that as well. So if nothing's noted that could be erroneously causing the changes that you're seeing, then obviously follow any standing orders for fluids, pressors, medications, and then notify the provider of those changes. All right, so the next bit of troubleshooting is when you're going to have blood that's backed up into either the PA catheter or the pressure tubing. So if you ever notice blood in any part of your PA catheter tubing or the pressure tubing, then we do need to correct the cause. So first, turn the stopcock off to the patient to prevent more blood from backing up. From there, check all your connections and make sure that they're tight and that they're connected, and then check all the stopcocks to make sure that they are closed off to air. Ensure that you have enough fluid in your pressure bag and that it is appropriately inflated. And doing those things should be the, the main culprits in most cases of why that would be happening. So once you have that problem that is identified and you've properly corrected it, then go ahead and open the system back up to the patient with that stopcock and then run a fast flush to get the blood back to the patient and clear your line. All right, so the next bit of troubleshooting is going to be if you notice that your patient has an erratic waveform with highly variable pressure. And especially if they're not correlated with movement or their respirations, then this is probably the result of something that we call catheter whip or catheter fling. And this is where the catheter basically is moving too much in the blood vessel, and it's typically caused by a turbulent area flow where the catheter is currently sitting. So here, contact the provider and let them know they may need to adjust the position to get it away from that area of turbulent flow. All right, and then finally, last but certainly not least, is going to be in our troubleshooting if your patient develops hemoptysis or you notice sudden bloody secretions in the endotracheal tube. So first, and very quickly, you need to get a hold of the provider. This could actually be a sign of the pulmonary artery perforation, and this is a medical emergency and potentially a life-threatening situation. In fact, patients who do have perforation, that 30% of them won't actually survive it. Also, make sure and let your RT know ASAP, and then in the meantime, want to ensure that you are having patency of their airway, and really we want to try to prevent any further alterations in oxygenation or ventilation. Quickly, we're going to want to send off and or do bedside point of care for coagulation studies, uh, as well as to type and cross-match blood for them. Obviously, if large enough, we may just begin a transfusing uncross-matched O blood, and this could really turn into a massive transfusion situation. Quickly prepare the patient for rapid transport to IR or OR if that's going to be needed. Um, time is obviously going to be of the essence, and we don't want to delay in this, so have this ready to go. That way, if that's what the provider wants to do, you can just go ahead and move quickly. And then in some less severe cases, you can expect getting a chest x-ray to also be obtained as well. All right, so those cover the most common things that you're going to come across when it comes to troubleshooting your PA catheter. Um, hopefully that was a lot of good information for you guys. Um, it's definitely good to know these steps on what you want to go through and what you're looking for and how you can possibly correct that. This also concludes the series on PA catheters. So again, a lot of great information in there. Um, I tried to break it up into bite-sized lessons, and then they're all in a playlist for you guys so you can go back and refer to that whenever you need it. 
So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release, otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.